On the 7th of August, we left Paris by sleeper. Only people with military travel permits were allowed to travel in it. It was a terribly exciting moment to come to Germany after an absence of 14 years. I did not want to sleep that night, but travel consciously every mile, whilst all the happenings of those years passed through my mind once more. Finally I heard the first German talking, or rather shouting, to each other. They were people employed at the station who told each other the whereabouts of this or that pushcar. Being shouted, these unimportant sentences got an uncalled for importance. Still, for days or weeks to come, one had to get used to the loud voices, which made one wonder whether people thought that the strength of an argument had anything to do with the loudness of the voice in which it was presented. We travelled on a clear night. The moon was shining bright through the ruins, which looked unreal, almost like theatre sceneries. Finally, about 12.30, we passed the Harburg bridges and arrived at Hamburg Hauptbahnhof. But the train did not stop. On we went, past the Lombardsbrücke. Anxiously, my eyes looked for the Moorweide, the Rabenstraße, but there was no Moorweide. There was a large army lorry park and further down large tents put up by Zirkus Knie. Also, the Rabenstraße had so many houses and corners missing that if I would not have known that it had been there, I would not have recognized it. Again, I was clasping my bag in order to get out at Dammtor Bahnhof, but the train did not stop there either, but on we went to Altona. This stretch I would not have recognized, and whilst I was still trying to reconstruct where we might possibly be, the train stopped abruptly. A young girl had thrown herself under the train and committed suicide, a sad and gruesome start for our trip. Ten minutes later, we arrived in Altona. We looked for the joint car, but the telegram, which had been sent two days before stating our arrival, had not arrived in time. We went to the military office, but could not get any transportation. But, oh miracle, Marvo found the one and only taxi which had been ordered by a party which did not arrive, and so after having confirmed the driver's question, sind sie Engländer, sonst darf ich sie nämlich nicht fahren, he took us to the Atlantic Hotel. We drove through the Allee, the Holstenstraße, etc., and saw miles of demolished roads, of Trümmer which had not yet been cleared away and where iron barns glared into the air. These iron constructions, on which the cement floorings were still partly hanging down, reminded one of the devil's abstract constructions. During this taxi ride, we learned that Germans must have a special permit if they are to get a taxi from the pool. They must prove that there is an urgent reason why they require one, such as an emergency. Otherwise, no taxis are granted them. Finally, we arrived at the Atlantic Hotel. Again, no room had been reserved on account of the slow telegram. The receptionist told us that there was no single room vacant, but that he could put us up somewhere else. No, no room had been reserved in our name. A few seconds later, he inquired whether my name was Wolf Warburg. When I confirmed this, he said that a letter had been delivered for me already quite some time ago, and actually, if he came to think of it, he thought that he still had a double bedroom with a bathroom. Nobody could have been more surprised than I about this reception. The letter turned out to have been written by Wolfi, whom we rang at once and who collected us. With him we went to the bank. I asked for Gertrud Kummerfeld. She had tears in her eyes and could hardly speak. She still has her lovely blonde hair and was one of the few people who looked rather healthy. She took us upstairs. We went into father's room, which in the meantime had become a meeting room. A long table in the middle, not a sign of the beloved writing desk, nor of the Stehpult. Next door, Fritz's former room, as untouched as if he had left it yesterday. We saw Kessal, who looked unchanged, just a little mummified, and who was nice but had not much to say. Brinkmann was on holiday. We then took the U-Bahn to get to Wolfi's flat. Never in my life will I dare to think again that the New York underground is crowded. One just tells oneself that one never heard of claustrophobia, and finally one arrives. Wolfi's flat is near the Heilwigstraße and in a part of Hamburg which is almost undamaged. He and his very amusing and wonderful wife Vera live in a house in which they call two rooms their own, only as her profession, being a masseuse, makes it necessary that she has a second room, otherwise couples are only entitled to one room. We lunched with them, 
and had a festival meal consisting of potatoes and salad and a rhubarb kreutzer as a second course, it tasted delicious. The rhubarb had been a windfall, and the potatoes, which were meant for the four of us, could have easily been dealt with by Marvo alone. After our dinner, we walked across the Lombardsbrücke, and turning in the Klopstockstraße, we found to our great joy that she had been renamed Warburgstraße. This, I learned, had been suggested by the Senat. The house in the Rabenstraße has been pulled down. Only the basement and the ground floor are still standing. The iron front doors, of which the Nazis had out the initial, looked blind and sad. Only the Rotbuche in the garden seemed of untouched and eternal beauty. 9th of August. Miss Margulius and Miss Adler collected us a little later at the hotel. Then we drove to Kirsterberg and on our way stopped at Jürgen's vegetable shop. He and his wife were overjoyed to see us. They are just as good-looking as ever, and their four children are mere joy. My heart was beating faster and faster the nearer we approached beloved Kirsterberg. There are at present ninety children there. Their ages vary from five to seven years. Besides them, there are about thirty grown-ups. The park has sadly changed. The Birkenhügel had disappeared, a victim of Karlschlag. The Kiefernhügel also had lost many of his beautiful trees. The orchard, the rosary, the kitchen garden, the Roman terrace were completely neglected. Weeds had grown in every direction. In fact, it felt as if one was coming down to earth again after a thousand years and stepping down the steps of the open-air theatre once mine was brought back to the first day of creation. For on the open scenery lay a Naktaman, the river filled with weeds and the Schweinesand spread in all directions.